In a failing city, a dying supercar is on the ropes. When Detroit's automotive-based economy goes south, the last true muscle car from the Motor City is laid off. Those were dark days. The economy deteriorated, and we were left without a Viper. In the depths of despair and the middle of bankruptcy, a former designer is thrust into a moment of choice. It was a strange time. Cars like this are not natural when you're rebuilding a car company. His solution is simple. Put pen to paper and redesign an icon. What could be a better symbol of resurgence than, than bringing back the Viper? The result, a clandestine project hidden in plain sight that culminates in a machine known the world over simply as the Viper. It's the peak of a 20-year-long quest for American speed. A massive 8.4-litre V10 roaring loudly to the tune of 640 tyre-torching horsepower. And 600 foot-pounds of frame-wrenching torque all of which rockets the machine to a top speed of over 320 kilometers an hour. But as of April 2009, the fifth generation of the Dodge Viper was permanently grounded. The company went through a bankruptcy and we were left without any prospect of doing a new Viper. The 2008 financial crisis affects car makers around the globe, forcing Chrysler into bankruptcy, including their Dodge division which manufactures the Viper. Chrysler was in financial troubles, the economy was bad. The automakers were struggling. They were running out of cash. There was talk of bankruptcy. I actually lived in Detroit during all the bankruptcies, and the mood was just awful. A bad mood made worse when Chrysler kills the Viper. I can only imagine that the reason that Chrysler killed the Viper is because it just wasn't selling anymore. It had run its course. You have to understand the company's going through so much at the time, it had so many other priorities. Ralph Gilles, a former head designer, is thrust into the CEO role for Dodge's SRT performance division. We were building new plants, we were fixing older cars, really trying to, to become a relevant car company, at the same time develop the future. If there's one person in the entire automotive industry that PR people never want in front of a camera, it's Ralph Gilles, because he curses like a sailor, but he tells it like it is. Tasked with raising the spirits of a now beleaguered company, Ralph decides the best cure is to dream big, supercar big. The depths of the worst time to the darkest hour, we actually gave a sketch assignment and had a lot of the designers kind of doodle on what the next Viper could look like. At least they could dream and they could look beyond the bankruptcy. What better elixir than having a, a job like that? So, you know, the designers were sketching these beautiful, passionate things, and it was, it was gorgeous. So gorgeous, in fact, that Ralph Gilles is compelled to do something financially irrational, yet emotionally satisfying. He greenlights a secret project determined to bring the Viper back. There was a room in the back of the design studio that was under lock and key. The designers would sneak back there and work on Viper concept because it wasn't an approved project. I remember the first time Ralph called me, he said he wanted to put together a proposal, keep it really quiet. Nobody had signed off on this. They actually went so far as they built a whole real full-size model all under Ralph Gilles direction and completely without the boss's knowledge. I think Gilles was genius in saying to the guys, all right, look, let's just have some fun. Let's see what happens. Like all good spy thrillers, before you can have a clandestine project, you need a code name. The term that we had been using in our meetings and in the hallway was, hey, we got to keep this below the radar. And uh, Dick said, well, why don't we call it F-117? Because that's the stealth fighter. A stealth project for a very rowdy machine. We call it a war room where we kind of write down, here are the things we want the new car to be like, and here are the things we don't want to lose about the old car. The Viper didn't happen initially through corporate channels. In typical Viper fashion, the first element discussed is speed. We wanted to actually reduce the aerodynamic drag so that we could achieve a top speed of 206 miles an hour. 
331 kilometers an hour would make Project F117 the fastest production Viper ever. But to do it, the iconic body needs to be completely redesigned. It was purely driven by what the wind tunnel was telling us. So to hit our top speed target, a lot of the front end design, we had to change. The team decides to add some more muscle. We felt like we were toughening it up a little bit. There's a lot about the car that harks back to another era. I mean, it's a simple, unfettered, uncomplicated machine. New CEO Ralph Gilles embraces a harsher facade. It's meant to be flexing its muscles. When you behold a Viper, you see the tension in the system. So we wanted the car to feel heroic. To save weight, the new body would be made from aerospace-grade carbon fiber, a proper material for a project named after a fighter jet. But redesigned bodywork and materials alone don't get you over 330 kilometers an hour. The covert team would also need more power. Lots more power. When you achieve speeds in that realm, you have to add a lot of horsepower to go faster. To build a better afterburner, Ralph turns to the wily old veteran of Viper engines. For the past 20 years, Dick Winkles has continually found more power for the V10 power plant. Ralph had uh, kind of challenged us for horsepower. Dick and his team squeeze another 40 horsepower out of the engine, yet they also reduce its weight by almost 12 kilograms. The engine's outrageous. You know, at 8.4 liters, 512 cubic inches, nobody's doing engines that big. In the world of supercars, power to weight ratios are everything. More power and less weight translates into only one thing. Faster acceleration. It's about motor. I mean, this, this car is a motor strapped to a transmission and rear-wheel drive, a bunch of seats and airbags. The proposed upgrades to the fifth generation Viper would give it a ratio rivaling million Euro exotics, but at a tenth of the price. Yet high performance alone isn't enough in the rarefied air of the supercar world. If you think of the original Viper, we spent all the money on the horsepower and going fast, and it was really an engineering-led exercise. You go to today, and that, that isn't good enough. In 18 years of production, the Viper averages 1,500 units a year. The expectations for the new Gen 5 machine are set at 2,500. We've always been a low-volume producer. I mean, the, the Viper's best year was 3,000 cars. To be more successful, the new machine needs to appeal to a wider audience. The biggest challenge that, that Viper faces is trying to appeal to people who are used to more, shall we say, traditional supercars. Two very different constituencies must be courted. Current owners and drivers who historically don't care for the Viper. We spent time interviewing competitive owners, people that wouldn't buy a Viper if their life depended on it. If you lose your core base and you fail to attract new customers, that could be the real danger for them. Perception of the Viper is a crude, raw sports car. What makes a Viper a Viper is the rawness of it. That's always been the appeal of the car. I mean, you had a big engine, a manual transmission, rear wheel drive, and it was up to you to make it all work. For years, the raw, back to basics feeling was a selling point. You have to remember, it didn't have windows, didn't have air conditioning back in the day, so it was a pretty interesting car to, to own. And that's what people liked about the Viper. The modern supercar landscape is different. Drivers have evolved. They want more technology, more comfort, and more performance. To succeed, Team Viper will have to walk a very thin line. We obviously wanted to mature the car. We didn't want to lose that edge that Viper has. It's a battle for the soul of the machine. We knew we had to take the car to the next level in terms of refinement, quality, materials, finish. Do you continue to be raw or cave along the cutting edge? We've got a lot of the modern accoutrements, but we haven't lost the soul of the vehicle. 
result is a Project F117 presentation. We took one of our favorite sketches, we developed it. We kind of had a new car sitting in the middle of the dome. We had the leadership surrounding it. The team of engineers and designers stand by as the future of Viper is decided. We were sitting in a, a very small board meeting, and Ralph Gilles made a very impassioned plea to sell the car, but that wasn't enough. And it's one of those vehicles, until you really see it and behold it, you don't understand how special it is. So we pulled the drapes off, and the reaction was pretty incredible. One look gives the new Viper life. It was an absolute surprise for them, and they walked around, they looked at it, and they said, like, we have to do this. I mean, look at it. We cried. <laughs> I mean, you'd work so hard to get it done, you couldn't help it, you know? We had a nice little celebration. Gilles' secret project pays off, but a grim reality still remains. How can a car company, riddled with financial woes, in a city devastated by economic collapse, recreate a supercar icon? It's dawn in the Motor City a place that's had hard times, but is bouncing back. Team Viper is one of the reasons for the resurgence. They've just been given the green light to resurrect an icon. But first, they have to rebuild the Once Story program from the ground floor. Our staff at the time was very, very small. It was a handful. You could count the number of people working on a Viper on one hand. We needed at least more than 10 times that just to get started. They bring the Connor Avenue assembly plant back to life. It's the last car factory within the Detroit city limits. In the case of Connor, that was a commitment. We had a choice. To, to, we could have moved it out to a, another plant, but we decided to leave it there because we believe that's part of the story. We're very proud of the fact that Viper is the only car being built in Detroit. That is the center of the American car industry for so long, and this car is such a throwback to old American muscle car-y coolness that it just makes sense for it to be built in Detroit. In 2009, when the Viper ceases production, the plant's condition quickly deteriorates. We had a good year before production of the new car to fix the place up, and that's exactly what we did. We brought the crew back about uh, eight months early and started refurbishing the plant. Frankly, I had to chase the raccoons and pigeons and things out of here before we were actually to bring people in here. To build the new car, the team needs to finalize its design. When you get uh, approval to go, you don't have all the questions answered. A lot of design work, a lot of engineering work, and a lot of problems to be solved. With Viper's parent company still recovering from bankruptcy, the budget is tight. We've got a certain amount of money, a certain amount of time, we try and get the best bang for our buck and make the car really something special. Time is counting down. The machine is made up of over 3,700 unique parts. The most important are the ones you can touch. The Viper's impervious to trends. It will remain a Viper, and that's what a Viper's about. It's a finger in the face of convention. It's a finger in the face of society, basically, and how society might change. The Viper's not going to change. They start by reinventing the Viper's interior. When the Viper first came around, it wasn't about the interior in the car. The truth is, in the last 20 years, worldwide, the supercar market has changed a lot. Designer Tomei Jovanowski is the man tasked with bringing the Viper's interior into the modern era. This is a very iconic vehicle, so with that in mind, uh, redesigning an icon is always a big challenge. The emphasis is put on one thing, leather, and lots of it. We wanted to almost revolutionize the interior, but still have a little bit of the feel of the first vehicle. 90% of the new Viper's interior is wrapped in leather. We can customize it. The owner can make it as unique as they possibly want. Combined with the exterior options, customers can choose from over 300,000 combinations. With only 26,000 Vipers ever made, that gives owners a high chance of having a one-of-a-kind machine. We wanted the new car to be as close to a custom car to the individual as possible. The top-to-bottom redesign also gives the team a chance to incorporate the latest technology. It takes 30 computer modules, 5.8 million lines of code, and over one and a half kilometers of wire to power the Viper's electronics. I think that's one of the beauty of the Viper is its simplicity. 
makes it a lot more timeless. So the way we approached it is to have all the technology, but give it almost an analog feel. After years of avoiding new technologies, the team decides to give the Reborn Viper a 21 centimeter screen for driver information. It sounds pretty basic, but Team Viper has its own twist on the instrument panel. An illuminated, snake-faced tachometer when you reach high RPMs. A big part was to have a vehicle that will still look good 10 years from now or 20 years from now. While the interior design is an easy upgrade, evolving the machine's exterior is a more challenging task. Engineers modify the body for performance and make minute changes inside a secret wind tunnel. The two-story building features a 6,300 horsepower fan that helps Viper engineers seek the perfect aerodynamic shape. Swoopy, sexy curves are kind of A, more American, and B, I think easier to do in a wind tunnel. I respect the SRT guys for giving it as many curves as they have and making it this complex shape that's still sultry but doesn't lift off the ground at high speeds. Wind tunnels are a chance to see not only how air actually moves around the vehicle, but also how the air moves through it. All the ducts you see on the Viper, all the scoops, all the vents are all functional. And we spend a lot of time in the wind tunnel uh, to, to shape the ducts so they not only look good, but they work well. All of the vents are actually working. It takes a lot of aerodynamic know-how to get a car to not take off at 200 miles an hour, so to keep it on the ground. Cutting edge aerodynamics and an extreme power to weight ratio allow the Viper to achieve tremendous performance figures. But not every driver can safely reach those levels without some help. A major goal was to introduce the modern stability control in a way that allows people who haven't experienced the extremely high limits of a Viper to kind of get into it slowly, experience it, and find out, wow, this car's not going to kill me. Uh, it's fun. Modern stability control assists drivers so that they can push the limits safely. Stability control is basically a computer that watches everything the car's doing. It's looking at all four wheels. And if you start to spin any tires or you start to get sideways at all, it can apply individual brakes to straighten the car out. When the Viper first started production in 1992, the mere idea of electronic driving aids fought the back-to-basics approach. Now, it's mandated by the government. To sell a modern Viper, engineers have to add it to the machine. Team Viper's solution is as rebellious as it is simple. You can dial it back when you want to. You can turn it completely off. Drivers have an option of which kind of Viper they'd like to drive. Raw? Or refined? You can turn it completely off and go do donuts all day long and have a grand time if you want to. Some high-performance upgrades require computers. Others aren't that technological. The cross brace, which is now becoming an iconic detail of the new car, is actually comes straight from our race. The cross brace increases the body's rigidity by 50%, significantly improving the vehicle's handling. The race car term is that the car just feels so stable and so solid, like a race car. All that work on the track means nothing if the car doesn't look sexy. This car evolves, but it evolves in a way that you don't necessarily see. It evolved by becoming more powerful. It evolved by becoming better driving, better handling, better brakes. They improved all of that stuff. But it remained very much a Viper. And the Viper is sort of its own thing. When it comes to getting a top-of-the-line paint job, the Viper utilizes a factory like no other in the world. We had to find the perfect facility that was wide open, that would fit the equipment that we needed and have the room that we needed for all the people here, because people are what makes this paint job great. In a city wrecked by economic downturn, the perfect facility was in the last place you'd expect. 
a former discount store. We found a uh, former retail space. The 11,000 square meter space is home to 115 craftsmen who prep and paint up to six Vipers a day. When we launched a Viper, it came in one color and that was red. Today we have upwards of nine, uh, possibly 10 colors at any given time. There are very few shapes in the automotive world that you can paint any color, no matter how outrageous, and the car still looks good. The Viper's one of them. It takes 150 man hours to paint a single car. The Viper has one of the world's highest paint specifications that are out there. The only way to really achieve the colors and the finish is by people. We find some of the world's best car painters from the custom world, from the concept car and show world, and people who are huge enthusiasts that have that kind of talent and craftsmanship and attention to detail that you just can't get through any kind of automation. The idea there is, you know, first of all, get the paint quality to be show car level. It's a multi-coat, completely buffed out paint job. I would say today that nobody offers paint quality like we do. Once the bodywork is done being painted, it's ready to head to the Connor Avenue assembly plant. A factory that was once left for dead, but like the Viper itself, has now risen from the ashes of economic disaster. We've invested over $12 million in refurbishing the plant. It looks unbelievable. The 16,000 square meter factory is rebuilt by the same employees that now work on the line. During the factory renovation, each station is customized for comfort and efficiency. It was very exciting for them. It's almost like they got to renovate their own home before moving in. The Connor Avenue assembly plant is back in business. Team Viper hopes that they've developed a world-class car. The Connor Avenue assembly plant in Detroit, Michigan has just come back to life. Along with it, the Viper. A small team within the SRT program has worked tirelessly designing and engineering the rebirth of this American icon. The employees in this plant are really passionate about this car and about this plant. The people here are amazing. They're more like family. And some of them live there. They really, uh, it's their life. It's all they know. They've been there for over 20 years. The process starts with the machine's beating heart, the engine. It's an evolution of the engine. It's really evolved over the years. The Mammoth V10 has been roaring to life for 20 years. If you would have told me back in you know, 1991 you know, that engine that we'd struggled to get 400 horse out of was going to be making 640 horse one day, I'd have said you were crazy. The Connor Avenue assembly plant is the only Chrysler facility in the United States that still builds its own engines. They rely on old, you know, hot rod principles of, you know, guys working on an engine, guys bolting it together, and being responsible for that one engine. And that's something unique in the automotive world. The V10 is, is a staple of the Viper, and it doesn't have a lot of gizmos on it, but the way the engine makes its power is what's beautiful. The source of that power starts coming to life when the massive engine block is moved to the line. The enormous crankshaft is installed. It's rotated by the engine's pistons. Those 10 pistons are assembled next to the line. and then installed by hand. Craftsmen attach the oil pan, a massive aluminium flywheel, the first of its kind in a Chrysler product. You know, aluminum flywheels, that's something that the hot rod industry has used for years, you know, as a way to decrease the weight and get faster acceleration out of the car.
Finally, the cylinder heads. While the engine continues being built, the Viper frame is being prepped for assembly. It starts in a state-of-the-art automated station referred to as Net Form and Pierce. When it goes into the net form and pierce, it'll measure the frame, and it'll make all the necessary adjustments on how the frame is built. We've added robotics, which is something that the people at the plant were like, what are these things? You know, they've never seen a robot before. But other than the initial robotics, the rest of the plant is still handmade. The sophisticated robots create mounting points, which are accurate to within a tenth of a millimeter. That's less than one-eighth the thickness of a standard credit card. The frame will begin its journey down the main line, where 30 stations will transform the empty frame into a finished car. When the frame first hits the line, it receives the differential. It gets a lot of the pieces that are hard to install later the wiring harnesses, fuel bundles, the brake lines, all of those things. The smaller pieces are installed with precision to make room for the 8.4-litre engine and its massive six-speed manual transmission. It's probably the biggest naturally aspirated engine you can find. I mean, the thing is just an absolute monster. Most cars, the engine decks from uh, beneath the car. Viper, it actually comes up from above, and it is an amazing thing to see. Decking a car is an old Detroit auto term for installing the engine and powertrain. Adding the motor and transmission doubles the weight of the car at this stage. And this motor that is almost bigger than the, the frame, and you almost are amazed that the thing could fit. The transmission has to deal with 640 horsepower and, more importantly, 8.4 liter V10 worth of torque. So if you have a dainty little transmission with a dainty little shifter, it'll just rip it apart. To accompany the massive drivetrain, 355mm Brembo disc brakes are installed, followed by performance shocks. This car is probably too firm for a lot of drivers, but if you're the guy that goes to the track, you'll appreciate why it's got a crisp ride. Workers add the custom engine covers, and the cross brace. To get the wheels set correctly, craftsmen use something you won't find at the local tire shop. This is one of the most unique machines in the world. It's a contact aligner. It does all four wheels at the same time, and this is what sets the alignment for the vehicle to be an actual racing-type vehicle. Now it's time for custom-engineered tires. A quick bit of petrol, some fluids, and an airbox so the machine can breathe. The vehicle is a rolling chassis. You could literally drive the vehicle without any panels on and go down the road and everything because it, it's a hot rolling chassis. In most car factories, the dyno machine is at the end of the line, but not inside Connor Ave. The Viper will stretch its legs for the first time and hit speeds over 100 kilometers an hour. We're inside the Rolls booth. This is where we test the vehicle for full drivability, for quality, and for braking, for shifting. All of the aspects of the car will be tested. It's time for a quick ride to final assembly. 
where the naked chassis transforms from a 300 km per hour dune buggy into a real car. It starts with more handwork as the wrapped leather trim pieces are installed. Italian leather seats. The leather wrapped emergency brake. Finally, the Viper's carbon fiber skin is set in place. When you see the skin go on, when you see the bright colors go on, it's amazing. It's almost like a model car. They add the roof. The quarter panels. All of the aerospace grade panels are fit precisely. If a panel doesn't fit correctly, it comes here to station 270, where they check for dimensional accuracy using a robot-controlled laser. The car is a hand-fit car. If you slow the production process down, it's a 70-minute cycle if you're lucky. It's the only car still made in Detroit. And they assemble it the slowest way possible. The finishing touch is the redesigned badge. It's the last of 3,700 pieces that make up the machine, all of which are now inspected. Right now we're at the very end of the final assembly line. The car is completely built at this point and it will be going from here to final inspection. These robots go in and measure the gap in flush, how the car fits. It scans a laser stripe on the vehicle and then another camera measures the way the line bends and then the computers can extrapolate the way that gaps in the flushes are actually performing. Twenty six hundred and fifty liters of recycled water are used to check for leaks. That's the same amount of liquid as in an eight-person hot tub. Finally, every millimeter is looked over by a man and a machine. Workers get one last chance to ensure the Viper is perfect. It takes approximately five days to make a Viper from start to finish. The Viper is built like, a, like a, a model car, and it's really neat to see it come together so quick. And it, it reminds me of that, you know, that, that incredible feeling when the car's coming together. They don't need to do these cars, they're not necessarily profitable, but, but they show the spirit. And that's what the auto industry always was about, you know, is about proving who you are, proving your metal. It's, it's the gladiator side of a car company. On a brisk January day in Detroit, Michigan, 1989, Chrysler unveils a radical new concept car Results will change both Ralph Gilles' life and the American auto industry itself. I think everyone was thinking, holy shit. They were back on the map. Everyone was noticing them. And you look at this thing and say, where did this come from? At the late 80s, Chrysler wasn't in a great spot. And they needed something to sort of build up the engineers to tell the world that there were car guys alive at Chrysler. And they came up with this. So I'm a student uh, going to school. I came to Detroit to be a car designer, and I went to the 1989 Detroit Auto Show. I'll never forget when I saw the Viper there. It just blew everybody away. It was something that nobody expected. It stole the show. You know, it was like 10 people deep surrounding the, the turntable, just staring at the car. 
The concept car was the original Viper RT10. Originally, it was the RT10, but there's no emotion in a bunch of letters. Viper. It tells you right out the way. It's going to bite you. It's rough and gruff. It kind of looks snaky. It always did. At the time, you have to understand, you know, for Chrysler, this was a pretty amazing moment to have something so radical to be seen. It purely was an exercise by a bunch of enthusiasts inside Chrysler that said, hey, let's, let's show the world that our mojo is still there. And they never intended to build a car. But they did build it because fans around the world forced them to. Of course, you know, letters came, people were waving checks, and the company was compelled to do it. One of those letters is from Graham Henkel. When I was a 24-year-old engineer coming home, getting my automotive news out of the mailbox, there on the cover is this sleek, sexy sketch of this black Viper, rumored to be the new sports car from Chrysler, and oh my god. Fast forward to today, where Team Viper is hoping to recreate that same buzz and restore one of the most prolific American supercars ever made. It's not just a sports car, it's the most extreme, most exaggerated version of a sports car you can possibly get. When you hit the gas, that thing lifts up and takes off in a straight line. You're just looking at the world rushing past you and these big old fenders sticking up. You can't not smile. The interior is a lot nicer than the original one. It's still not what you'd call up to the standards of, for example, a Ferrari or some of the other cars, but the Viper is not that expensive either. At just under 73,000 euro, half the price of any Ferrari or Lamborghini, the SRT Viper is one of the most affordable supercars. This is the most over-the-top American car you can possibly buy. It's got the fattest tires in the back. It's got a huge hulking V10 under the hood, 8.4 liters worth. Look, it's the ultimate Acme rocket strapped to the back of Wile E. Coyote. The crankshaft itself is about the size of your leg. This is just a massive car on a massive scale, and there's really nothing more American than that. The Viper blasts from zero to 100 kilometers an hour in just 3.3 seconds. That's two-tenths of a second better than the previous generation. The machine's top speed of over 320 kilometers an hour is a remarkable 14 kilometers per hour faster than its predecessor. This car does not want to coddle you. It doesn't want to take you to dinner. It wants to strap you down and beat you mercilessly. That's what makes it so much different than anything else. It's quick. It's really, really quick. And it's basically held back by traction because, I mean, it's got 640 horsepower under the hood. The Viper is still one of the quickest cars on the road. The current generation Viper will hang with any supercar. Matter of fact, it has records all over the US. The Generation 5 Viper breaks the track record at the infamous Laguna Seca Raceway in California. wanted this to be America's supercar. An American supercar with a totally manual transmission. Thank God for it. I mean, paddle shifts one might be faster around a track and might be easier to sit in traffic with, but American muscly sports cars should have a manual transmission because it makes you work for it. In the case of the Viper, it wants you to break your kneecap. It wants you to break your wrist. The Generation 5 machine is the most modern and the fastest Viper to date. SRT will go on and on about their seats being comfortable and the interior being nice. This is not about that at all. It's about going out for a two-hour drive on a weekend on a nice day and then being exhausted by the time you get home. It's just staggering. The hood is ridiculously long. The proportions are ridiculous. It's got the short deck, the long hood, the ridiculously huge tires. The car is all ridiculous. I mean, a superhero would drive this car. This is totally the Batmobile. A supercar for a superhero that started life as a back-to-basics racing machine.
raced it in the 24 hours of Le Mans. And as the car developed, it became better and better to drive. But it remained very much a Viper. Viper is sort of its own thing. Viper debuted in 1989, no one saw it coming. Since then, it survived the ups and downs of the United States auto industry. And along the way, helped to redefine the American high-performance automotive landscape. But the core of the car's soul is a very simple machine. And the Viper isn't really high tech. It's an old school, huge American engine. With rear wheel drive and a stick shift, it's simple. That's part of its beauty. It's part of what makes it American. The car's been refined over the years, and this one is the most refined Viper ever, but there's still that rawness to it. It's a car that should never have been born. A machine that survived an economic collapse and exists purely due to a group of dedicated designers and engineers who wouldn't let their clandestine supercar dream die. Not many cars are actually built in Detroit anymore. Most of the factories are out in the suburbs. It's a point of pride to be able to say that their coolest car is being built in Detroit, in the Motor City. have the, the ability to take the car to the limit and you realize how much capability it has, there's nothing like it. And that's the beauty of the Viper. It's as irresponsible as you were at 17 and it hasn't grown up and it's never changed and it probably never will change because it's one of those things that'll never mature. It's been a long trek to get here but Ralph Gilles and his team of designers, engineers, and craftsmen have battled the odds to resurrect an American icon. It kind of scares you to death on the street, and I think that's the point. You want to be scared, you want to be exhilarated, and then the big secret is you get it to a racetrack and it's actually a pussycat. It doesn't do anything you don't want it to do. This is a stand-in for a mistress. It's a stand-in for drinking too much. It's a, it's a stand-in for overconsumption because the car itself is about overconsumption.